Harry, one of the things uh, you said about we were talking about India and you have this eco marathon here. This is the first time we are doing this in India, etc. What do you hope to get out of India? I mean, what do you see the possibilities here specifically, not just in the development center, but from the country? What can we, in what way can we contribute toward innovation in Shell? Thanks, Lakshmi. And, and uh, I would... Uh I would first and foremost say that I think the opportunities are boundless, almost. And we see them in so many different ways. I mentioned in my speech the talent that we see in India, and, and so Thank we're you. incredibly pleased with, with the people here who are doing wonderful things. We are also incredibly interested, of course, in the Indian market. Mm -hmm. uh, it is so fast evolving. Um, it is such, at such a fast scale. And so we feel as a company, there's a very good fit with our capabilities and our products. And at the same time, it's, as I said, so dynamic and evolving that it's almost like a, a live laboratory. Yeah. Uh, uh, where you can pioneer and pilot many different solutions. So if you look at the diversity of our product mix here in the country, it's already quite stunning. Yeah. Uh, and so we're working with a variety of companies we are delivering our own products, whether conventional hydrocarbon fuels, um, efficient fuels at that, you know, with V-Power, mm -hmm. lubricants, with Helix and Maxima, and, um, but, but also already deeply involved in, in electric vehicles, battery technology. Um, we're working to provide LNG for heavy duty freight and trucking. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so we, we are finding our ways into the market wanting to deliver products that our customers want and need in a variety of ways. And in that, India is actually a trailblazer globally, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, it has our great interest. Um, so there are so many aspects that are attractive and make India attractive that, um, that, as I say, it's almost boundless. The last thing I'd say is there are also many people here in our operations in India that are supporting Shell globally. So when you ever talk to some of our staff here, you'll find that they could be on a given day supporting our operations in the US or in the UK um, and, and making the most of their technical capabilities in, in helping other people in Shell be successful. And uh, in some ways, you know, Shell's a global brand and it's a very visual brand, right? We see it everywhere on the freeways and all that stuff. So as we go more into electrification, we are looking at it. I mean, in some ways, you are... Um, questioning your own business, right? Uh, and preparing for when this goes away, what will be next? What are some of the things that you're doing in, and what percentage of your efforts are in um, non-oil-based, futuristic um, uh, ideas or experiments? Or what are some of the things that you're doing that are very interesting? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. And uh, I, to what extent are you, are you cannibalizing your own, your own yes. business and success? You know, I think it comes in many different ways to say, you, you have to have a North Star. You, yeah. you have to put out a waypoint in the future to say, is where we want to go as a company? And clearly we, we've set out a waypoint by saying, by 2035, by 2050, we know what the carbon intensity of our business should be. And that's not just simply to arrest emissions, but it's also because we think that customers by that time will want those yeah. type of products. And so to your earlier example, you know, is the internet going to be successful? Well, we think that internet is going to be successful. Yeah. What is very difficult to decide is the right. scale and the pace. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're making steps in each and every one of the areas. And so to your question around how big is that? Well, you can measure it in many different ways. So we're investing upwards of a billion dollars every year in what we call these sort of lower carbon products. Mm -hmm. And some people would come to us and say, well, it's not a, lot, not, a lot, not a lot of money because you're investing more in your conventional business. And we would then say, well, you know, this is about making choices and finding your way. And by most people's standards, more than a billion dollars is a lot of money. That's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it, of course, not all of that takes a lot of money. So we're investing a lot in expertise. We're investing a lot of innovation and technology. And we're investing a lot in partnerships. Mm -hmm. We have uh, uh, a startup incubator here called E4. And we're working with a, a variety of small startups, specifically in that space. Yeah. Now, they may be companies of 10 people, but we're providing them support in terms of expertise. They can use our laboratories. They will get a bit of funding to become successful. 
Now, that's a relatively small scale, but one of these companies can be the, you know, if you want the, the, uh, the intel of the future, uh, and, and we would want to be part of that. So those partnerships are very important. Yeah. We do that in the areas I mentioned, biofuels, hydrogen, um, battery technology, and a variety of other ways. And that's how we want to find our way to the future. Mm. Last to say, the most material investments are in power. So we're investing in renewable power generation. We're investing in power-related solutions that are either in front of or behind the meter and are acquiring companies to that extent. One example. We've acquired a company called Green Lots. They provide electrical charging infrastructure in Asia mm. and the US primarily. Uh, I think they, they've actually set foot in India, so, so we're bringing that company here. We have invested in a company called Cleantech. They are a solar developer in India, quite sizable. So that's how we're putting together the mosaic of solutions that eventually will grow to a big scale, and, and that's how we're approaching it. You're also a member of the Executive Committee of World Business Council for Sustainable Development. So when you pull yourself out of the company and looking at the global uh, scenario, and when you're part of this council, what are the biggest things that people are discussing today? I mean, obviously you're interested in energy. Are people looking at energy a lot more? Are they looking at water? Or are they worried about... You know, what are the global, uh, uh, you know, issues you see coming in, the, in, in this council? Yeah, thank you. The, 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 uh, um, the organization represents more than 200 companies. Um, and uh, some of those, the biggest companies in the world, uh, many also quite small. Uh, so it's very diverse. Uh, and our agenda is, uh, is, is shaped around a number of themes. So we have a theme around energy and climate. You would expect. Yes. Uh, we have a, f a theme around food and land use, you may oh. expect. Uh, we have a theme around the built environment and urbanization. Um, we have themes around the future of work and so social issues that surround yes. that. And so we have a number of big blocks that are very much our focus. And as companies, we, we obviously have one or two focus areas for our city is energy and climate, but it's not restricted to that. Because of course, given the nature of our, of our enterprise, our global presence, all these issues in some shape or form are present to us. Okay. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is help each other in progressing uh, and pursuing these themes yeah. um, by putting expertise, funding, partnerships, um, and all sorts of manner of um, efforts in action. We have some work on the way to articulate a vision for 2050 mm. for business. Uh, and we will work from there back for each of the, the preceding decades to define what we as businesses mm. want to see in yeah. terms of action. And last but not least, the organization itself is then also the mouthpiece for business with respect to the United Nations, uh, yeah. the IPCC and the various other multilateral uh, institutions uh, that are interested in the views of business. So that's how we try and sort of okay. work the dialogues and um, establish the partnerships. With them. Um, are there any questions from the audience? I want to leave you with a question, Harry, which you can think about and answer at the end of it is, uh, Sada said you're very good at connecting seemingly unrelated things. So I thought I'll give you a couple of completely unrelated things like the sky and shell and see how you can connect it with the story. So think about it meanwhile. I'll do my uh, best. <laughs> yes. <laughs> any question from the audience? Hi, Harry. Very nice to hear about uh, many initiatives that you are doing in India, which uh, kind of helps right now in terms of the job creation aspects of uh, what the government is aspiring to do. So my question to you is that uh, what aspect of job creation that you are also trying to empower women, right? Because India is a country where a lot of women needs help and support, and uh, uh, it's all very deep, deep problems. They have skills, they have the attitude, uh, particularly, you know, women from tier two, tier three, tier four cities. So what is Shell doing in those lines? Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. That is a great point, uh, and something we, we try and actively make a difference. So if I can connect two points. One is, so we, we are in the process of growing our retail uh, network, um, we are, at this point in time, the largest um, fuels retailer in the world. We have 45,000 outlets. Unfortunately, we only have 150 in India or so. 
I, I know it's growing by the minute. Somebody's going to pick me up and say, you know, it's 151. That may well be true. Um, and we want to grow that very significantly, pr probably tenfold from there. Um, when you go to our retail stations, what I hope you see is many women, uh, because we make a point of employing women uh, at the forecourts and in the retail stations, uh, and they do a fantastic job. We, we also make a point of employing uh, people with, uh, with disabilities. Uh, and, and so I hope when you visit our retail stations, you also see that because they are also fantastic employees, very service minded, very focused on our customers uh, and absolutely tremendous. So when you think of the growth in our retail network, you know, I think Nitin once told me that, that if we get to full scale, at least what we're aiming for in the coming years, there are probably something like 200,000 jobs involved around it, indirectly. And if we, could just, if we could just project what we are doing in our forecourts with our own people into the 200,000, my sincere hope would do, actually we, we will be able to have others and ourselves employ thousands of women um, who of course, you know, we all want to be part of the workforce. So, so that's one example, our people can give you many. Um, uh, but, uh, but it's never good enough. Thank you. So Harry, how do we connect the sky with Shell? Let's think of a story. Uh, well, well two, two things, if I may. So, okay. so first of all, um, one of the things we try and do in Shell is, is uh, ma make the impossible possible. That's why we have make the future. And uh, so, so in some ways we reach for the sky. Yes. And uh, just earlier this year, we, we, uh, we put on the water um, and we put in operation the largest floating object in the world. Mm. It can be seen from space. It's called Prelude. It's a, it's a vessel that is offshore Australia, liquefying natural gas in a field that otherwise would not be, would not be developed. And it is then transporting that uh, liquefied gas to Asian markets where it's in part substituting coal for power generation. So we think that, you know, that, that is a unique object that I think only we could have, could have created. So reaching for the sky. When we think about the future of the energy system, it's hugely important for us to envisage, is, envisage that, this in a certain way that is consistent with the Paris objectives. Yeah. So people have asked us because we have a, a long-standing scenario practice around the energy system. So what would the, the system look like if it were to be consistent with Paris? So we said, let's do that work. Let, let's imagine a system, an energy system by 2050 or 70 that is consistent with the Paris commitments. And we actually developed a scenario called Sky. Because there you we, go. we felt it was very <laughs> stretching. We were reaching for the sky that would be consistent with uh, climate change, consistent with less than two degree warming. Uh, and that has been the, the sort of the, the, the framework for many of our, uh, our considerations around what products do we need to develop, by when, our conversations with countries and leaders. Um, so, so Sky is very present to show. There you go. He proved the point that <laughs> he can connect to seemingly. Thank you so, <laughs> Thank you so much, Harry. So Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Thank you.